classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics Cambridge University Press 2011 and today this lecture is lecture 21 polyelectrolyte slow mode thermal and sore coefficients I'm Professor Phillies, and this is the continuing series of lectures on polymer dynamics and their phenomenology. Uh, today we're going to be continuing and probably concluding our discussion of Chapter 11 on dynamic light scattering and the relaxation of concentration fluctuations in polymer solutions. Uh, we go back first to the discussion of the neutral polymer slow mode and I'm going to bring out a few particular features that we didn't entirely discuss last time. The first issue is that if you look at polymers in solution and there's for example work of oh, <coughs> there are a couple of things you can do and one thing you can do is to look at the um, first cumulant of the spectrum, which is a light scattering intensity weighted average of all of the modes. And another thing you can do is to do a mode decomposition. And what is found, if we look in, is that at low concentration there is a mode and its relaxation rate, this is gamma, the relaxation rate, increases with increasing concentration. And then, at some concentration, you start to see a slow mode. Uh, we're not on the same scale. The slow mode, important issue with the drawing is that gamma of the slow mode decreases as you increase the polymer concentration. So you have two modes. They both show this behavior. Um, uh, the other important feature of this, we're saying there are modes. And the modes are both found to be Q square dependent. The significance of Q square dependence is that it corresponds to diffusion. That is, you have something where there is a diffusion current which is proportional to a diffusion coefficient and a concentration gradient. And then you have a um, continuity equation dc dt equals del <coughs> dot j, divergence of the current. And if you stick the diffusion current in here, you get dc dt goes as del dot d grad c. Um, now, if you approach this by saying we will put in, take a spatial Fourier transform, equivalently we will look at the relaxation of a spatial cosine wave, each of the grads gets replaced by an IQ, and you have dc dt proportional to minus d q square t. And that is a mark of normal conventional diffusion, namely that the modes have a q square dependence in them. If you, however, go in to systems that shows a slow mode, there are a variety of ways of breaking down um, how many modes there are and what you're seeing. There's some question of how many parameters you can really pull out of a light scattering spectrum. And I've presented simulational evidence that a reasonable number is oh, 6 or 8 rather than 20. Nonetheless, there are alternative approaches for doing this. And for example, I note the work of Wynn Brown, who of course was looking at light <coughs> scattering spectra that had very wide ranges of decay times, meaning it's easier to pull out more parameters, and who found in the slow mode a, mix, a mixture of Q square dependent modes and Q to the zero, that is wave vector independent modes. 
Uh, how can you get something that's q to the zero? You're looking at some internal relaxation, and the particles do not have to move to change how much light they're scattered. So there's no particle motion involved. Instead, the particles, for example, um, change their ability to scatter light through some or manner, which is not at all specified, and they're just sitting there. So this is the scene the same at all scattering vectors. Pushing be there's another way to push beyond this, which was discussed when we talked about probe diffusion and hydroxypropyl cellulose. And that is in, to take spectra, and if you don't think that the modes are well characterized, well, you try to fit the modes to something. Uh, one choice is to fit the modes to sums of a few cumulant series, which as far as I know is perfectly legitimate, but that has never been explored very much. Uh, another alternative, though, is to fit the um, dynamic structure factor to something of the form a e to the minus theta t to the beta plus a slow e to the minus theta t these t slow beta slow printers hate you if you give them something like a form like that uh, and so you fit to a sum of stretched exponentials in time. The point of fitting to stretched exponentials in time is that stretched exponentials in time appear to describe well the time dependence, accommodate well to things that really aren't simple exponentials, and only use a few parameters. However, based on the comparison with concentration stretched exponentials, where you can pull out a derivation based on renormalization group arguments, uh, there's no reason not to suppose that those aren't the fundamental forms. So that is the sort of thing you have. Now, if you then go in and ask what sort of behavior you have, um, there are a few slightly odd things that you sometimes find. Uh, for example, there have been found slow modes in which the slow mode goes as q square up to a point, and then rolls over and is basically independent of q. So at short distances, you're seeing something that's q independent, some sort of structural whatever. And at large, at small q, small q corresponds to large distances. At large distances, you're seeing something diffusive. Uh, there is also, one perhaps should note, uh, an odd note due to a Nicolau. They look at mode relaxation times and they find the slowest mode. And it has a relaxation rate. And then they go and look at me mechanical relaxations. That is, you take the liquid, you apply an oscillating shear and vary the frequency. And there are internal relaxations that contribute one way or another to what you're seeing, but those have a characteristic time. And if you measure the characteristic mechanical time, um, it corresponds exactly, or at least approximately, to the slowest time you see in the optical spectrum. However, there is a complication. The complication is that um, if you do this in a theta solvent and you take up the temperature, if you take up the temperature, the optical mode disappears. The mechanical mode is still there. So the, apparently the mechanical mode was coupled to something that scattered light. And whatever the coupling was, uh, either the, cu the coupling may not have disappeared, but the light scattering did. However, the slow mode is still there. Now one thing you might do is to ask, well, you have a fast mode which gets faster and faster as you increase the polymer concentration. You have a slow mode which, when it appears, slows down as you are forming the polymer concentration, increasing the polymer concentration. And you reasonably ask, um, 
how is this to be interpreted? What are we seeing? Uh, an indication of this is done by crossing over and looking at polyelectrolytes. It has been known for a rather long time that polyelectrolytes show a slow mode. And the issue with the polyelectrolyte slow mode was asking what it was or was not. Uh, some of the same debates that also took place with the neutral polymer slow mode were present. And the issue is that if you go back to, oh, 1980, digital correlator technology was really at or beyond the edge of what it could handle. Um, I do recall when we were working at Michigan with polyacrylic acid and probe diffusion and polyacrylic acid, uh, you hit a point at which there was a viscosity transition of the sort we'll be discussing. Uh, the diffusion coefficient of the probes decoupled more and more from the viscosity of the solution. And there were issues with the scattering spectra of the probes. And since what we had at the time was a fairly limited 128 channel linear correlator, it really appeared as though you were getting additional slow modes, but we knew we couldn't get at it with the technology of the time, so we sort of cut off where we were going about the time the slow mode cut in. Okay, so it, most of this te the text does not treat polyelectrolytes, which are a very complicated problem. The reason we are discussing polyelectrolytes here is that we have a specific set of experiments due to SEDLAC which clarify what the polyelectrolyte slow mode is and do so in a way which makes reasonably clear that similar sorts of things are reasonably interpreted as happening for neutral polymer slow modes. A SEDLAC worked with 50 and 710 kilodalton um, sodium polystyrene sulfonate. A polystyrene sulfonate is a polystyrene that has been chemically modified and out at the edge you have a, a, a group that can be neutralized and at this point the polystyrene sulfonate is a polyelectrolyte and is quite water soluble. And so what Sedlak did was to work with these. And the first thing he did was to say, well, we'll dissolve the spectrum, dissolve the powder. It come, typically comes as a powder. And we will look at the spectrum. And since there's some question of whether it, we're at equilibrium or not, we will simply keep looking at the same spectrum. And he did this out to a one-year time scale. Well, it just requires patience. And what he observed was that S of Q, which is the light scattering intensity versus angle, which gives you the distribution of sizes of whatever they are in solution, was independent of time, proportional to time to the zero. Uh, and therefore, the distribution of clusters sizes was not changing. However, as time went on, the scattering intensity fell, and the diffusion coefficient increased. Now that's a little peculiar, and the question is, how can the diffusion coefficient be increasing and the intensity falling if you are, um, the size distribution isn't changing? Uh, the following picture appears, which is consistent with everything else you're going to hear, appears to explain this. We start out, and there are some number of fairly dense clusters. <clears throat> and the fairly dense clusters will occasionally have a single polymer strand sticking out. <clears throat> this is not yet an equilibrium arrangement. Over a year, what happens is these very exposed chains, which are not very well attached to the, whatever it is, fall off. The number of chains in a cluster decreases because chains get out of the cluster and not back into them. 
Uh, because the cluster has less matter in it, it scatters less light. Because the cluster is more porous, because you've taken parts out, it has a higher diffusion coefficient. And this picture, from the initial cluster to a final cluster, explains all of the experimental measurements. Now, that doesn't prove it's right. And one of the questions you ask is, well, is it possible you're just looking at the fact you didn't really dissolve things completely, and if you had waited to a 10-year or a century uh, time scale, is it possible that you would have found better data? And indeed, on glass problems, there are several Dutch groups that have set samples. We need to do long time scale on the working time scale of the experiment, which will not be done by the current people completely, is out to a century. Of course, they have to be very careful with their samples. So, having asked, is this equilibrium or not, um, Sedlak um, tried another set of experiments. Now, let me back off a step in a historical note. The polyelectrolyte slow mode probably should, the early studies should all be credited to Mickey Schur, who very recently retired at Washington, and his collaborators. And the feature that is observed is that if you have a polyelectrolyte at high salt, there is no slow mode. But if you take the polyelectrolyte down to low salt, very little dissolved salt, you see the slow mode. And there, there, the fact that this is uh, salt sensitive uh, shows that it's a polyelectrolyte effect in some sense. Uh, the fact that you see odd effects for polyelectrolytes in solution in the absence of background ions, uh, this is a general issue and low ionic strength polyelectrolytes are an even more complicated problem. <coughs> Nonetheless, what um, Sedlak did, which was in line with this, was to say, we will take sodium polystyrene sulfonate and high salt, and we will pass it through an 0.05 micron filter. Um, 0.05 micron is about the finest filter you can find commercially. To, uh, filter water soluble whatever <laughs> getting anything through it uh, is a feat of great patience but he did it and having done all this he found high salt very well filtered there was absolutely no slow mode now when Sedlak said no slow mode his experiments did one thing that others a lot of others do not that is, there are a lot of experiments that will report effectively a ratio of the intensities of the fast and slow modes. What Sedlak did was to use uh, light scattering standards to calibrate, and he was therefore able to measure the absolute intensity of the fast mode and the slow mode separately. And so he could actually say how much fast mode there was. The reason this is of interest is revealed by what happens when you take these cyst samples or, and dialyze to remove salt, or equivalently if you just make samples in different salt concentrations. Namely, you do dialysis, which extracts the salt from solution, and after you have done this, you find the slow mode. Now the question is, why are you seeing the slow mode? And there are in fact two sorts of explanations, one of which is ruled out by Sedlak's experiments. Uh, one notion relies on the statement, I have a polymer solution, a polyelectrolyte solution. I pull the salt out. I measure the intensity of the scattering or the intensity of the observed fast mode as I take the salt out, 
And what I find is that as I pull the salt out, the intensity plummets. The particles repel each other. It's much harder for them to form concentration fluctuations. And so the fluct concentration fluctuations are small, and therefore the amount of light scattering is small. Now one thing that could happen if um, gamma, if the um, intensity of the fast mode is falling rapidly, is there actually was a slow mode here all along. However, at high salt, the slow mode was so weak that it could not be seen um, due to the scattering by the fast mode. As you pull the salt out, though, the intensity of the slow mode is perhaps independent from concentration, salt concentration, and therefore the slow mode rises up out of the deeps like a rock left behind on a beach as the tide recedes. Well, that's very clever. However, you can rule that out if you do absolute intensity measurements. Because if you know the absolute intensity of the light here, you can work out how, in, you know also how intense the slow mode would have been here, you know how intense the fast mode is here, and you can simply ask if there was actually this much slow mode present, would it have been hidden or not? And the answer is no, it would not have been hidden, it would have been quite visible. And so what Sedlak showed by measuring scattering intensity is that um, quite clearly the slow mode actually does appear when you pull the salt out. Now the other thing that Sedlak did was to sit there and um, look at the scattering of, from, due to the slow mode as time went on. And what he found was that S is cubed, scattering versus angle was fixed. That is, you had some distribution of objects and solution that were contributing to the slow mode. And they were large enough to be comparable in size with a light wavelength. <coughs> and their size distribution did not change if you let the sample sit for very long times. On the other hand, if you let things sit, the intensity of the slow mode rose. This is this year experiment again. And the diffusion coefficient fell. And if you looked at intensity of the slow mode versus time, you could start with let's dissolve things in pure water. And the intensity of the slow mode fell as time went on. <clears throat> you could start with no clusters, let's dissolve things in pure water, let's um, pull the salt out, and the intensity changed the other way, and the two attempted to converge. There is a reasonable interpretation of this observation, which is that you are looking at equilibrium clusters, if you have them and the, their innards are too concentrated, the innards empty out. If you have them and their innards are too dilute, they pull in more chains and they tend towards an equilibrium size. And therefore, the reasonable interpretation is that you are looking at equilibrium domains in the solution and you can approach the domains uh, either from a side where you have them initially too concentrated or a side where they are initially too dilute, and they converge to the same point. <coughs> we can also note two other sets of experiments. One set is due to Kong et al., and this is the Russo group in Louisiana. And what they did was to say, well, maybe these, let us look at this accusation that the domains are due to problems with dissolving the powder. We will synthesize our polymers from scratch, and we will never take them out of solution. They were made in solution, they have always been in solution, there is no dissolution step in their history to cause any difficulty. The second experiment quite different, is due to Tanato and Quill. And they did op uh, 
in essence, optical microscopy. And they looked at systems, among other things, systems that show domains. Well, they look at the systems that show domains microscopically, and they can actually visualize things that are about the right size. They're not very distinct, because after all, these are solution structures. They aren't solid bodies, and the solution structures, whatever they are, are about, if I said they were about a half a micron or a bit less, that's about it. So they're quite large. They're much larger than an individual polymer chain. <coughs> and you can actually see them. Maybe you can't see them very well, but you can actually see them. Oh, last experiment, SEDLAC. SEDLAC started out with, again, and this time he started out with polystyrene sulfonate that was non-neutralized. It was so that, well, non-neutralized is not precisely correct because if you have any acid group in water, organic acid, whatever, it ionizes, to, auto ionizes to some extent. So it has some charge on it, but mostly it's not charged. And what he then did was to say, we will now add sodium hydroxide and we will neutralize the polymer, meaning we will pull off the protons from the acidic groups, and the polymer will now become extremely heavily charged. And what was found was, as you add NaOH, the intensity of the fast mode drops dramatically, and the intensity of the slow mode you sit around and the intensity of the slow mode keeps climbing. That is, you can approach this in, along one more axis where the solvent basically doesn't change. The polymer is dissolved in the solution and all you are doing is changing the charge on the polymer molecule. And you see the same behavior this other way. Okay, so we have seen all of these alternatives. Question. So both of these experiments show that what you're actually observing is the equilibrium structure eventually. Yes. The experiments all converge to agree that you are looking at an equilibrium structure in solution, a structure that is considerably larger than a single polymer molecule. And the various properties, some of which I've skipped over of this picture, agree completely with the polymer slow mode seen for neutral polymers, namely for neutral polymers, the, um, both modes are Q-square dependent. The fast mode, which corresponds to nearby to, to chains interacting with each other as single chains, D increases as you increase the concentration because the chains repel each other. The slow mode, the vitrified region, whatever it is, acts like a diffusing large object and it behaves as though you were doing probe diffusion and therefore as you increase the polymer concentration the probes are slowed down. Okay, so you might reasonably ask uh, how does this compare with what we know about glasses or things where you might see this phenomenon? And there is an interesting analogy which I will pursue for a few minutes. And the interesting analogy is with the Kivelson glass model. Uh, this is Dan Kibbleson mostly. He's past, he was one of my postdoctoral supervisors. He's since passed away. <coughs> the issue is as follows. Suppose, and we'll plot this versus temperature, we look at the behavior of a, li a liquid versus temperature, and we look at the viscosity. And if we look at the viscosity versus temperature, as we cool something off, the simple behavior is you cool it off, you cool it off, 
you get to the melting point and at the melting point you go from a liquid to a solid a, a crystal and gee there's no more viscosity the thing just sits there that's simple freezing however many substances if you take them and cool them off you cross the melting point and you can just keep on going and the viscosity goes up and up now there are some substances in which you cool and cool and you eventually hit a lower limit below which you cannot have a um, liquid and the at the lower limit what happens is uh, you are form you start the likelihood of forming crystallites in solution goes up very fast with decreasing temperature and the material turns into uh, crystalline solid but there are other liquids where you cool things off and cool things off and cool things off and in the end you get an amorphous solid but it really does seem to be solid it's a glass this one. The question of the nature of the glass transition is very controversial and very complicated. And it's mostly beyond what we're going to talk about. There are, however, a few other peculiar features of the glass transition, one of which is you cool the liquid off, you now heat it up again, you heat it up to out here someplace, and you see excess light scattering relative to the amount of light scattering you expected in solution. And the ex excess light scattering stays around for very long times. It wasn't here originally, but once you've run the liquid down and back up again, you get this excess light scattering. And the question is, how are we to interpret all of these different phenomena? What Kibbelson proposed was you cool the liquid off and at some temperature it starts forming clusters. He talks about, and his collaborators talk about, clusters that are icosahedral packings of atoms. And the clusters are thermodynamically stable. However, the clusters cannot lead to crystallization. Why not? because icosahedra aren't space filling. If you get 20-sided dice and try packing them together, you can pack cubes and make nice crystals. You cannot persuade icosahedra to pack because there, it's not a space filling geometry in three-dimensional space. And as a result, the icosahedral crystals objects try to grow but as they grow, because it's not space filling, they have to distort and they, there's strain energy coming in and some, at some size you have a frustration limit and the clusters cannot get any bigger. That's the front part of the model. Now the fact you make more and more of these clusters down here sort of explains why the viscosity goes up. The viscosity is going up for the same reason that the viscosity of ice slush is higher than the viscosity of liquid water. Namely, there are these little unbending things in solution and they get in each other's way. Now we come to the create, truly brilliantly creative contribution. And the creatively brilliant contribution is the statement, these structures are not space filling, they can't give you the crystal, but they're thermodynamically stable. That is, the clusters have a melting temperature, and the melting temperature of the clusters is higher than the melting temperature of the pure crystal. As a result, they're still stable and liquid out here. Once you've made them, you heat up beyond the melting temperature, and the clusters stay around to some significantly higher temperature. And 
they then contribute to the viscosity increase. They then increase, the, and the large increase, and the extra light scattering, they explain why you form a glass. And there's one other thing. Suppose you've made these and you would like to crystallize. You would like to rearrange the atoms in a nice crystal lattice. In order to get from here to here, you have to break up this structure and form the preferred structure. Well, the potential energy, the uh, free energy barrier in between can be quite large. So even though this is the preferred structure, the stable structure at low constant to low temperature, in order to get from here to here, you'd need to supply very large number amounts of thermal energy to the transition state. And guess what? That thermal energy is not available. And therefore, even though at low temperatures, the frustrated crystal may be less stable than the real crystal, once you've made them, you can't make them go away easily, not, by just, by, not just by sitting and waiting. So that is the Crick Kibbleson glass model. Uh, I have done molecular, with Paul Whitford, uh, molecular dynamic simulations which appear to show, reveal the presence of Kibbleson clusters that have the, exactly the properties that Kibbleson would ascribe to them, including a few that I haven't gone into. Uh, the only difference between the clusters we found and the ones he described is that the clusters Whitford and I found uh, show septahedral, seven-fold ordering, not icosahedral, 20-fold ordering. Uh, septahedral ordering is extremely unusual in nature. Uh, if you didn't think there was a reason to look for it, you might not have done so, but that is what we found. Okay, what, do, what does this have to do with the slow mode? And the answer is, we have the polymer molecules, and they form these objects, which in polyelectrolytes have a higher density than the surrounding solution, and in neutral polymers apparently do not. And these objects are frustration limited, grow, limited, meaning they can't grow more than they do, clusters, uh, they form at higher concentration and contribute to the viscosity because you've got clustering. And so these are the glassy objects of the Kibbleson glass model, except we have a working ex experimental case where they actually exist. Okay, <clears throat> we are now approximately done with the um, discussion of the slow mode. And the question is where we push on to next. And one answer is Rayleigh Brillouin scattering. So we will talk for a piece about Rayleigh Brillouin scattering. This is, in some sense, the scattering that answers the question, why does the sky glow bluish in uh, uh, daylight. Uh, in any event, uh, the answer is that we have set this thing up. We have a liquid. We scatter light from it. And the light, to some extent, changes frequency when it's scattered. We can do this with a simple liquid that does not contain diffusing macromolecules. Uh, the scattering light uh, changes in frequency and scattering are quite large, like 10 to the 9 hertz or more, meaning um, you don't use a digital correlator to study them. You use a Fabry-Perot interferometer or one of several relatives. And but we, if we put in monochromatic laser light, here's frequency. I will put in laser light of one frequency, nu zero, and I will ask what frequencies of light are scattered out. And the answer is, you see a spectrum short of, sort of like this. And there is a central <coughs> peak. And there are two shifted peaks, one shifted up in frequency, 
one shift down in frequency. Um, and how do we interpret this? Well, this peak is due to heat diffusion. You have fluctuations in the local energy density in the solution. The energy fluctuations create mass density fluctuations, so they scatter light. The um, way the fluctuations go away is they, the energy diffuses out of them, which is heat diffusion. And so the width here is determined by the diffusion coefficient for heat. These two side peaks are out at frequencies C, not speed of light C. And the frequency C is the local speed of sound waves in the solution. Why are there sound waves in the solution? They're thermally excited just the way diffusive motion is thermally excited. And the sound wave peaks also have a width. And the width is determined by dissipation that kills off sound waves. So you have three peaks there. And one of the things you can imagine doing is to add a polymer to the solution and ask what happens. And the short form answer is that polymer molecules occur on a very long time scale. This material is at the gigahertz range, a very short time scale. And therefore, um, the two don't couple to each other a lot. However, if you go through from low polymer concentration out to the melt, uh, what you find is that the frequency shift here changes with polymer concentration. The widths change, and therefore there is some sort of weak sensitivity of the rayleigh brill one spectrum to the fact that you're uh, chain replacing the solvent with polymer. That shouldn't be in very surprising. After all, there's no reason for the polymer to have the same thermal diffusion coefficient and speed of sound as the solvent. And as you move from pure solvent to pure polymer, something ought to happen. And it does. Another thing you can study is the um, Fourier coefficient. The notion in the Soray coefficient is revealed by the experiment used to study it. You use uh, laser interferometry to create an interference grating in the solution. That is, you send in two beams of light, same source, so they're coherent. They come in at two different angles, and they interfere. Mm -hmm. And because they interfere, they appear produce a brightness grating. Well, if you do this with a high power source, you don't just have a brightness grating, you have locally heated the material. And now there's several things that happen. Um, and the first thing that happens is you produce a fluctuation in the local energy density, and that diffuses out due to thermal diffusion. The second thing that happens is that you have the Soray diffusion and the notion here is that you have a matter current which is proportional to the Soray coefficient and the temperature gradient. That is, if you create a temperature gradient in a solution or in a gas, objects diffuse parallel to the temperature gradient. Um, there are a couple of minor co complications here. First of all, the effect is also known in gases, and the mechanism in gases would appear to be quite different than that in liquids. Second, unlike some other diffusion coefficients, the Soray diffusion coefficient can have either sign. That is, if I produce a temperature gradient like this, the temperature gradient will just drive the motion of the macromolecules, but it may drive them one way, or it can drive them the other way, and each is, can, is a, an allowed outcome. Um, that's the Soray diffusion coefficient. People have actually observed that in polymer solutions. 
and you can actually see things. Okay, that's the serrate. Oh, I was describing mode. So we have an energy mode that relaxes. We have a concentration mode which relaxes with the diffusion coefficient for concentrate, mass concentration. And then in some systems there's also an intermediate mode which is descri sometimes described as an alpha mode and sometimes described as a structural mode. Uh, however, the evidence that it's, if you, I asked you what is the structure that is doing its structurating, uh, there's no real answer. It's just described as a structural mode. It is a reasonable interpretation by comparison with viscoelasticity. But if you, I asked you what is the structure, well, that's, we're still working on that one. Um, okay, another set of experiments, a different set of experiments. And the set of experiments are here is a solution, and here are some A polymers, and here are some B polymers, and we take the A's and the B's and we dissolve them in a solvent, and we say that the, the mixture that is, the polymers are such that both polymers are concentrated. Now we had previously talked about the case in which there was a matrix polymer that was allowed to be concentrated or not, and a tracer polymer which was always dilute, and we looked at the single particle diffusion of the tracer polymers through the matrix solution. Here, matrix and tracer are both potentially concentrated. There are an extensive series of, experiment, of experiments to test theory by Ben Muna. Um, agreement is reasonable. There are a number of tricks you can pull in this system. First of all, if I am clever, I can arrange things to do index matching And if I index match, perhaps I can only see one of the two polymers and not the other. Second, I can arrange things to what is called zero average contrast. So that if um, I increase the concentration of A, and I increase the concentration of B, but I keep the ratio constant. That is, if I have a concentration fluctuation that moves more mixture into the solution, that's a fluctuation, I can arrange the solvent so that there, there is no change in the index of refraction. And therefore, fluctuations in the total concentration of polymer assuming it's uniform in, in composition, do not scatter light. Under this co condition, what scatters light is the something that changes the concentration of A relative to the concentration of B. So you do a theory for this, and get out answers. Well, what does the theory look like? The core issue is as follows. There is a diffusion coefficient for the motion of A as driven by a concentration gradient in A, and that causes the concentration of A to change. Also, there is a diffusion coefficient that couples to the con concentration gradient of B, and that causes the concentration of B to change. I should actually um, be consistent and write these as the currents, not the D concentration, D time. 
Yes. However, these are a non-dilute solution. These are cross-coupled. There is a DBA, which is the diffusion of B as driven by the concentration of A. And there is a DAB, which is the constant, which is the diffusion of A driven by the concentration of B. So there are cross diffusion coefficients. Furthermore, there are reference frame effects. The basic issue in reference frame effects is if I say there is a current of A, there are A particles moving that away. There are two sensible ways to measure the current of A. And one is to look at the motion of A relative to the solvent. And the other is to say we are in a closed container. Here is the closed container. If there is an A particle moving that way, it must be, because it's a closed container, it must be displacing the solvent. So solvent moves that way. And it just displaces everything in a non-preferential way. And therefore, there are B particles pushed the other direction because A is displacing them. This is the reference frame effect. The reference frame <coughs> description is due to Kirkwood. <coughs> And the reference frame motions are independent of these cross diffusion coefficients. That is, the two effects add independently. <clears throat> the consequence of the reference frame effects is that if I write the diffusion equation in a reference frame fixed on the scattering cell rather than the solvent, these various D's get mixed up in different ways to some extent. So DAA concentration gradient of A driving a motion of A will also directly, due to reference frames, contribute to the motion of B and vice versa. And so there's, a, there's some interactions. The problem was solved for polymers by Ben Muna. There have been a series of experiments to test his theoretical models. And the models, well, work pretty well. They really do. <clears throat> they're somewhat coarse-grained models in the sense their description of polymers is um, not, we are looking at single polymer chains and polymer hydrodynamics in the kirkwood Reisman sense. It's a very coarse-grained description of what's going on. But at that level, it works quite well. I shall very briefly note alternative to light scattering, neutron scattering. Now, the core issue in neutron scattering is, that, in particular, inelastic neutron scattering. We send in neutrons of one energy. They are scattered by the sample in its first born order approximation scattering. They come out in some direction, and they come out with some change in energy. The change in energy is equivalent to a change of frequency for visible light, and it corresponds to the fact they're scattering off something that is moving in the system. Now, the one difficulty is that in order to use this to study, say, diffusion, the energy changes are extremely small. And therefore, you have to do something very clever in order to measure them. And the clever thing is a result due to Mazai, known as neutron spin echo. And it's, um, an experiment which is very clever. It's been done at a small number of laboratories. And it, in fact, gives you the energy shifts to very high precision. OK, so you scatter from neutrons. It's like scattering from light. There's one minor difference. If I have a polymer, 
the, if it's say polyethylene, it might be for regular ethylene. We could also replace the protons with the deuterons, and now we have perdeuteroethylene, in which all of the hydrogen has been replaced with a D, and we could also do this so there are different amounts of H and D. The scattering properties for neutrons of hydrogen and deut hydrogen one and deuterium are radically different. And as a result, by changing the isotopic substitution in what is otherwise exactly the same system, you can see some fairly interesting results. Um, a, a, of particular note, if you adjust the HD ratio just right, if you have, say, a polymer and it's randomly substituted with H and D, if you get the ratio just right, the polymer becomes very hard to see with neutron scattering, and you can focus your attention on other things. Mm -hmm. And this allows you to do what is, in essence, tracer diffusion, self-diffusion measurements in polymer solutions. Uh, what has been done uh, is also to do experiments um, on dilute chains uh, dilute chains have been studied. Uh, the feature here is, uh, and this goes back to what we said a lecture or two ago, the Cora made fairly specific predictions, namely there is a mode that is diffusive. There is a second mode that includes diffusion and also a relaxation object whose relaxation goes roughly as QQ. And the issue there is you can actually see the two modes. This has also been done before using light scattering. However, with neutron scattering, a representative wavelength on which you might be working is, say, eight angstroms, so where you are looking at motion on a much shorter distance scale with neutrons than with visible light. That brings us to the end of our discussion of light scattering. And I'm going to put a break in the tape at this point. And greetings to the second part of today's lecture. We're now going to advance from a discussion of quasi-elastic light scattering, neutron scattering, and such not, to a discussion of viscosity. Um, the physical notion of viscosity is represented by a single sketch. We have two extremely large flat plates. One of the plates is stationary. One of the plates is moving with some speed dx. The two plates are separated by some distance l in the z direction. And therefore, if I plot v sub x versus position, the traditional assumption was that v sub x versus position is linear in position, and therefore dvx dz equals this v0x, the actual velocity at the top, over L. You see, it's a velocity gradient. Velocity that way, gradient that way. Uh, the assertion that the um, velocity gradient is the same everywhere cr across um, has recently been shown to run into some severe problems if you push hard on the system. Now, of course, there's an obvious alternative assumption if I take two parts and move one with respect to the other. If I have a solid block and I start moving the solid block top with respect to the bottom, I get crazing and shear planes and the thing severs. Well, polymers are somewhat in between simple liquids, which do this, and solids, which break if you twist them hard enough. 
Uh, and we'll come back to that late in the course. Having said that, in order to keep the upper plate moving, you have to apply a force per unit area. And the force per unit area is determined by the velocity gradient, assumed to be the same everywhere across, and a constant eta. Eta is the Greek letter, and it stands for viscosity. It's the resistance to pouring. Now, that is. This is what is called shear, and this is the shear viscosity. There are two other viscosities that arise somewhat. One is, if we imagine a little volume of material here, the viscosity that comes in, if we imagine compressing or decompressing the fluid, for example, at some frequency, and changing its volume. And this is what is called bulk <coughs> viscosity. Uh, the polymer solutions we're talking about are mostly dissolved in substantially incompressible solvents. And therefore, you can't do this a great deal. There is, however, a third viscosity, which is extremely important in polymer engineering. And the third viscosity arises if we take a thin, long piece of polymer is usually done with a melt. And you grab the two ends of it and pull them in opposite directions. And as you stretch, there is a resistance to stretching. The resistance to stretching is known as extensional viscosity. And the point on extensional viscosity, uh, there's a resistance to stretching. Well, this is how you make uh, a lot of polymer threads in some part. You push the polymer through holes, and then if you want a really fine thread, you may, for example, stretch it, as shown here. Well, stretching is not quite trivial, and I've sort of indicated how it's done. Okay, so there are several different viscosities that you can imagine measuring. And what is found is that the viscosity of a polymer solution depends on concentration. And so as you add polymer, the viscosity of the solution changes. And if there's no polymer there at all, you have A to 0, the viscosity of the solvent. And then you have something of the form 1 plus K1 C plus K2 C squared plus dot, dot, dot. Uh, K1 has a name. K1, which is usually given the symbol eta embraces, is the intrinsic viscosity. It's the low concentration leading linear slope. Yes. Low concentration leading linear slope. Um, we can rewrite this equation, traditional rewrite. 1 plus C eta plus K H C eta squared. And I um, K1 is eta. In this form, I factored K2 into a KH and a C eta squared. KH is the Huggins coefficient. The Huggins coefficient is the lowest concentration term that reflects the interaction of polymer coils with each other. The linear term here appears simply because there are polymer coils, and you can calculate it to some level of precision by calculating how a single polymer chain moves, and then saying, well, there are a lot of them, so there's a lots times as many effects. Huggins, the Huggins coefficient, 
describes interaction between polymer chains. So that's K sub H. Okay, so having said that's K sub H, and we have an intrinsic viscosity, um, what do we do next? Well, one thing we could do is to ask what happens at higher concentrations. And the classical answer to that is the Martin equation. Martin presented a paper in 1943. My footnotes give the paper's title thanks to our very hardworking library. I, I have not found another source that supplies the title other than the original conference meeting report. And what Martin said, proposed, was that eta would be a to zero, e to the constant times the concentration. And he had data that supported this. It was a nice approximate formula, and that is the Martin equation. Now, one can do better than that, but I am going to pause for a second and point out something about the intrinsic viscosity. Uh, this has dimension 1, there, and this has dimension 1, therefore this must have dimension 1, and in units, the intrinsic viscosity in units must be 1 over a concentration. So C eta is dimensionless. C eta are, can be described as the natural units for discuss concentration units for discussing viscosity. Uh, how big? Where is C eta of one? Well, for a largish industrial type polymer, meaning molecular weights a hundred thousand, a million, something in there, C eta is some or eta, C eta is 1 when the concentration is oh, 1 or 10 grams per liter, something like that. It's a fairly low concentration. It's not like volume fraction where phi of 1 is unattainable because you can't pack to better than 0.72. C eta you can get up to, you'll be approaching the melt, a hundred or a couple hundred. Now there are two other sets of predictions of um, viscosity at higher concentration, and one, there are some nice papers due to Dale Schaefer that put this together, and the prediction is that viscosity at elevated concentrations goes as c to the x, m to the y, where x and y are powers. This is a reputation scaling prediction. Now for polymer melts, and I emphasize for melts, for polymer melts, the theory derives not only the y, but also the fact that it's a power law. That is, for melts, the model actually predicts the functional form. For solutions, that's not the case. But in solutions, you can predict the x and the y. Um, can we put in some numbers here? Sure we can. Let's get some more board space. Um, you can actually measure viscosity of polymer melts for different molecular weights. It's not quite as easy as it sounds and you have the serious issue that if you have a polymer, how do you determine exactly what its molecular weight is? And the answer is there are a bunch of methods that give you information, but there are several to 10% methods, not 0.01% methods. <clears throat> In any event, the um, reputation prediction, looking at c to the x, m to the y, is that y is some number, the traditional number is 3, Experimentally, y is about 3.4. This is for melts. Um, and there's 
there are some theoretical treatments that endeavor to resolve the difference. For solutions, you can also predict x, and x is some number in the range O 3.75 to 5, depending on solvent predictions, that's the predicted. And so you can actually predict some exponents. The alternative to this is eta proportional to eta 0 e to the alpha c to the nu, where alpha is proportional to m to a power. And that's the stretched exponential form. For viscosity, based on the kirkwood reisman hydrodynamics, and based also on uh, the positive function renormalization group method, you can actually predict this form, you can predict new, you can predict numerical values with no prefactors for alpha, and the agreement is, well, the cup is half empty or half full, it's actually pretty full. So, those are predictions. Let me just start on measurements since we are almost out of time. And we will start with figure 12.1. 12.1 shows measurements of Jameson and Telford. The measurements are on a 7.8 megadalton polystyrene in, uh, if I recall correctly, tetrahydrocurium. Now, 7.8 megadalton is an extremely large polymer. They looked at um, viscosity versus concentration. They did some other things which are in the book. However, if you look at viscosity, this is a log plot, you see a nice stretched exponential form. The stretched exponential form works well at all concentrations. You could also look, for example, at figure 12.3. 12.3 uh, shows measurements of Enomoto, and these are on a schizophilan. And again, if you plot viscosity versus concentration, you see these nice curves, and the lines are at least decently close to them. Um, if you look very carefully at the curves for the highest molecular weight polymer and dilute solution, the measurements actually show um, a viscosity which is a bit lower than you'd expect from the curve, which describes everything else quite well. But if you look at those curves, you notice the viscosities up here are extremely large indeed. We're looking at increases in the viscosity of multiple orders of magnitude, um, in some cases up to five or seven. And the stretched exponential describes nicely over the full range of concentrations what the viscosity is. I see, however, we are out of time, and therefore we will continue this in the next lecture.